It's not going to take too long. Again, I appreciate your attention. You guys have been great with, with, with staying with me. I know we went over a lot. You guys have worked on it over a lot this week. I just want to add a few things uh, that, that uh, Chad asked me to go over, a little bit of my coaching stuff that's, that's really helped me. And, and one of my favorite quotes is, uh, one person teaches and two people learn. And you guys as coaches, you're going to explore and learn a lot. One of the things that I've always put in uh, with, with my people, any chance I get, is I get them to teach stuff back to each other right away. I think that's a really great way for you guys to bring up the level of how fast you can train these recruits. Even if it's for a minute or two. But what's going to happen is as soon as you guys show a move, and then you go, all right, we practice a little bit, all right, you're going to teach it to these two guys, and you've got two minutes to teach that move and break it down. They're going to pay attention to everything else that you teach in a very different way. Because we learn things very differently when we know we have to teach it later. So you guys can implement that right away as a part of, you know, one of your guys' main goal is how do we get this across in four hours so that it sticks, right? It's not enough for them to have seen it and know how cool it is. We need them to walk out of that room knowing some things that they can apply today. And, and hopefully you can see that, that we've tried to bring in technique that's easily applicable in a short period of time. We're talking about very simple things. Once we get that basic grip, we can apply it from multiple spots, and we do. And now it becomes systematized through lots of spots in a very easy way to see. We talk about those base principles. But if you'll take advantage of the idea of getting them to teach just like you are, you'll get, you'll get it across to them faster. Experiment with it and see what you think. Uh, one of the other things that I see a lot of people don't, don't get the idea of is, is the difference between coaching and teaching. I always consider myself a coach, but a coach has to teach. Does anybody know what the base difference is between coaching and teaching? Motivation. Motivation, there could be a little bit of it. Coach would be in there. Coach is more involved, I think. More involved, could be. Could be on the floor doing it with them. I'm going to give you what my definition is. A coach questions and a teacher tells. And this is a big piece, again, of getting someone involved. So if every time you come to me with a problem right away, I just tell you the answer, you only know to look to me for the answer. But if I start taking and saying, well, what do you think? Now, depending on time frames you, as to how much you can do that, right? Sometimes we need to teach to be expedient. And we always have to have a reference before we can coach. So if I haven't taught them the move and I'm going to question them a bunch, they're going to just feel lost and stupid. We don't want people to feel lost or stupid in there. Not unless it's our friends on purpose. Apparently, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, but when we have those new recruits and they're a little bit scared, they don't quite know what's going on. They're looking to you guys for what, what am I going to get that's going to save my ass when I go out here? So we're going to teach them first. But every time you can slip in a question here and there, and when people ask you, go, well, what do you think? We just showed it. Where do you think the arm goes? Now, not to overdo that, but it's a great piece to put in. And the more you can coach, the more ownership they're going to get over the move. It's like them having to teach themselves now. And, and the pathways that get created and, and the memory and how long it lasts is going to switch and be at a much higher level. And that's what counts. doesn't matter what kind of system we can put together and that you guys can deliver. The only thing that counts is what do those guys take into the field with them when they leave. And so these are some tools that I've used in helping develop. Some of my best fighters came out of my coaches course. Guys like Chris Lieben, Ed Herman. Chris Wilson all made it in the UFC in under five years. And they were all coaches under me and took my coaches course and they learned how to question and they learned how to think for themselves. Now you guys are obviously already good at thinking for yourselves. You guys are okay with questioning and questioning within and without. That's great, some of these guys won't have that. You need to help them see the, uh, the, the advantage in being a questioning person and taking ownership for where they're at and understanding really what's going on and not just blindly following. Some of the worst words that can be used are, I already know that. As soon as we say those words, we stop from going on a growth pattern to a death pattern. Because going flatline is the same as being dead. And we always need to be open. One of the things that's helped keep our gym at a cutting edge level and doing what we've done is there's never been a position that we've said we know exactly what to do there. We always experiment. As soon as I see students, brand new students come in off the street, don't know what they're do, do something and it works, and you know what I go do? I go experiment with it. Maybe it was a fluke that it worked. Maybe it's too low of a percentage, but I'm going to go find out. Now, you guys have to have a set system to work within, but always be looking for those tweaks. And again, I love the questioning line that we had in here. 
keep that up. Don't always have a critical eye and don't accept anybody that says it's just because I say so. Anybody that starts saying that is afraid of exploring that they might be wrong and they're defending a position that shouldn't be defended. There's always another way. And there's always a question and there's always a counter and there's things that are worth exploring and there's things that aren't worth exploring. But they're all worth talking about up front. We may look at it and say that's too low percentage, it's not gonna happen enough to us to spend time because we just don't have time to get to that. But it may be a big thing and it may be really worth looking at. And that's why I said at the beginning, ask questions, get your people involved. As a coach, I can tell you, my athletes all know to come and ask me. And, and it's okay, there's never a, well, you can't question the coach. We built it into our, our feel of our gym and into our culture that to question everything is the right thing to do in a respectful way. So these are some of the things on, on, a, uh, on a coaching level. The last thing I want to talk about is getting back to routes and reps. The more things that you can make look similar where they go, ah, I do already know that because it's similar to this. Not because it's limited, but because it fits in with where we're at and you go. Because every time I got you guys back on route, I could see it. You'd see a smile pop up. Ah, oh yeah, I know where I'm at now. We stood up with the underhook. Oh, I know where I'm at. It's a place of comfort. To be where we don't know is uncomfortable. If you go to Russia, someone dropped you off, you don't speak the language, you don't know where you're at, you don't have a map, it's a little scary. Not because you won't make it, but there's so many unknowns. So every chance you guys get to tie together knowns in a way that makes it really simple in this pattern is going to be a really important piece. And that was the idea that I kept talking about. Get back to your route. Get back to your route. I went hiking once. I, I fell timber as a young man. Uh, and we, we went into some crazy places way out in the middle of nowhere. We did select cuts. So uh, where's my hippie friend? Dagman, he's in the back. Oh, there he is. Yeah, so don't get upset that I used to cut trees. <laughs> no, cutting trees down is good. He supports that. So we were walking along and my hat fell off. You know, you wear those hard brimmed metal hats so if stuff comes back and falls on your head, hopefully keep from killing you. I dropped and it rolled down this steep hill and I walked down and everybody kept walking. And I walked back and I could not find the route. And I was lost like that. And I knew exactly where the trail was, but it was so unmarked. And they had to come back and get me. And there was nothing worse than not knowing where my route was. Make it easy for them to find and reward them when they see those markers. When they get there and they get that underhook, there you go, you're back on your route, you know where you're at. Let them know and let them feel those things. It'll help them feel good. And when they feel good and they feel positive, they'll remember more. And they'll be more apt to want to use it right away. So the more positive feedback you can give, the better. And that's the last piece I want to talk about on coaching. And that is, anybody know how they train killer whales? <laughs> I'll give you, I'll so give you a hint. Whale 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 I'll give you a hint. <laughs> when they don't do what you don't want them to do, you don't smack them. <laughs> <laughs> They're called a killer whale. They train killer whales by doing this. They get them to jump out and do those tricks. They put a bar low in the water that's just low enough that it can barely swim under it, but easy to swim over the top. And every time it swims under it, they do nothing. Every time it swims over it, they give it a fish. They do that for a while and they raise the bar. And when it swims under it, not bad fish. This is a bad idea with a killer whale. They do nothing. They let that go. When it goes over the top, they give it a fish. They raise the bar. It goes under it, they do nothing. It goes over it, they give it a fish. They do this till the bar is out of the water. Swims under it, no problem. Jumps over it, lots of rewards. This is how you train a killer whale. This is also how you train people. We're not looking to find what people did wrong except to correct in a teaching manner so that we can get back to coaching. But we are looking for every chance that we can to give positive feedback when they do something right. Because the more we tie a positive feeling to what it is they're doing, the more likely it is to stick and the more likely they are to use it again. And again, we always come back, what's the outcome? The outcome at the end of the day is when you guys are done, not only for yourselves, but when you're teaching this to someone else, that, that we want them to go out and say, man, the training I got made a difference in saving my ass. Isn't that what we all want? You want people to be able to come back to you and not say, man, that stuff you taught me, got my ass kicked trying to use it. Barely got away. <laughs> this is not what we want to hear. So everything we can do to tie good feelings and get that motivation up so that we're using it, using the coaching. Uh, and, then, and then the last piece, sorry, I know I said last piece, is that 80-20 principle we talked about. Stay away from the minutia that doesn't matter until they get the big stuff. Stay away from the need to try and correct every little thing 
get them doing a big, big skill that feels good and get them moving on that. Reward it as much as you can and then add all the little details. Um, on, on, on the piece of talking about mindset training, because that to me is really what this is all about. And that's the pieces we're talking about. Um, with the mindset, how many people would agree that there's an inner game and a physical game? We got a oh, mental yeah. game, anybody? I, oh, yeah. right? And, and they're not separate. Well, I'm gonna th say that there's, it goes beyond that to an emotional state too. And we have to tie all three of these together when we do things. And this is what we were talking about, and this is what that coaching is, but to really kind of see that idea. But to think that the, those physical things, and this is why the training is so effective, when you start mixing in the training and you start mixing in the, the, the stress and the pressure at a level that's handled, being able to handle, and then stepping it up. Because if you make it too rough right out the gate, what happens? People shut down. People shut down, and then do they want to do it? No. Nope. Now they just avoid it. Now they start saying things like, well, I'm just going to go to my weapon first. Or I'm not going to make that call. Or, and now we get people headed the wrong way. So we build it slowly, but we have that, that physical, emotional, and mental. And we can start training that mental piece by how we talk to them and how we get them engaged. I can tell you one of the things I've done that's made the biggest impact in the shortest period of time. People having trouble getting things, whether it be full on fights or just learning a technique. The number one thing that you can do is by changing the look on their face. There's three basic components for how we experience anything. The first thing is our physiology. The second thing is our language. And the third thing is our focus. And this is a really important concept. So we have here, we got physiology, language, and focus. This creates all experiences in our reality, right? It's, it's why when you question five witnesses, they all say something different about the same event. Everyone will wonder how could they all see something so different? It's because their physiology was different, how they talked to themselves was different, and what they were focused on while that event was going on was different. It's why we all do similar things and come away with different ideas and different things. It's a beautiful thing, but it also can be frustrating. So if, you're, if, if while you're coaching someone or even for yourself, this is a huge thing. One of the easiest things to do is, is, is a lot of times we tell people, well, you gotta change your focus. You gotta be in a better emotional state. You gotta be aggressive. But a lot of people don't know how to access that in, a, in a, an efficient manner. We tell them, well, you gotta have good self-talk, right? You gotta be positive. But then you see what we tell people? Yeah, and you can't be down on yourself. You can't say can't. You know, it, the, as much as I've coached, I would think that most people got the wrong book as a kid. A little caboose that couldn't. I think I can't, I think I can. But these can oftentimes take some time to change. But if I can get them to change their physiology, and they're going, coach, I can't get this. Man, I don't know. Does this physiology look familiar for somebody who's frustrated and doesn't know what, what's going on? They go, that's great. And if, if, if you're feeling a little frustrated, that means we're right next to a breakthrough. That means you're getting close to learning something. That's exciting. What I want you to do is stand up straight. Breathe in deep and pull your shoulders back. This changes everything. I'm now in a learning state and I'm in a command state. Now, you're out there in the drill and guys are starting to run you over and when they're punching at you, you're getting a little bit flinchy. Now, you watch, their physiology leads it. You know when the guy's getting run over by the look on his face and what he does. His physiology changes. He'll be standing there, the punch is coming, what do they do? Make your face go like this real quick. See if you feel strong. <laughs> Right? This is not a strong position. So now we talk to them about how to structure their face so that the, the rest of this follows because one will lead the others. Of the three that's the easiest to lead from is your physiology. If I can get your physiology in the right place, these things have a tendency to fall into place right behind it. And it's easier to get people to do something physically with their body because we're from the Western world and we're disconnected from that, all that Eastern philosophy stuff. So, can take a guy and have him stand up straight. I'll use questions, I'll use my own language to get him there. And guys are going, man, it's just, it's overwhelming. All these punches coming, I don't know what to do. And I'll be like, hey, if uh, somebody walked in, you got kids, right? Somebody walked in holding your kid, threatening to hurt her, would you care if someone was punching at you? You'll watch a physiology change. You see the look on his face right there. He just visioned something very clear. Watch somebody, he watched somebody walking with his kid and be like, no, I'd be like, what'd you do? Like, I'm Right? And now that changes. Keep that face. Go back out, do the drill, and I want you to keep that face the whole time. Doesn't matter what punches are coming. Keep that thought, keep that face, and all of a sudden you will see a switch that's so unbelievably fast, it'll make your head spin. 
And if you can keep him in that, and I've done this with all kinds of fighters. I had one of my friends, he's 43 years old. He took his first MMA fight, 43 years old. He fought a 28 year old guy. This is no easy task. And he would come to me and he said, Robert, I'm, I'm a little freaked out, man. I don't like getting hit that much and I keep shying away. And so this was the exercise I did with him. I said, look over that corner. I said, man, if somebody just walked around that corner man, with your kid, what would you do? He goes, man, I'd go over there and I'd rip their head off. And I go, yeah, but what if they hit you? He goes, I wouldn't care. I go, what if they hit you? They took you down and they kept hitting you. He goes, I wouldn't stop until I was dead. We sent him in to do rounds right after that in practice. And, and he walked up to his first guy and he goes like this. And he looks at the guy and the guy goes, dude, it's just practice. <laughs> And he blew through the rounds and he went out in his fight and he got right in the guy's face and the guy hit him and he didn't flinch at all. But we had worked that mindset and we had switched it and we did it by changing his focus, by me using language and focus that changed it. And I got him to teach him how to hold his physiology in a way that was familiar to him. Because once he got that position of strength and his eyes looked a certain way, you know what it feels like. But some people don't have access to it as quickly as you do. By you helping them get to that spot and showing them how to do it, you can make switches that will happen very quickly because we only get, what, four hours? We don't have time to go through a whole lot of psychology and work with them over months. And why would you want to when we don't have to? So these are things that I've used, uh, and I use them on the spot. I use them in the middle. In, in the middle of a round, people think it's a minute. It's 40 seconds because i got to get in and get out before the minute's up. I got to give them water, I got to towel them down, I got to deal with cuts, and I got to give them psychological advice and physical advice. I don't have time to psychoanalyze, but I can say things like this. Like I got one of my guys, his term is bite down. And that's all I have to say, keyword to him. I go, bite down, Tyson. He goes, and he knows exactly. He'll be getting hit. Bite down, and he goes, and bang, bang. He's out throwing punches, taking dudes down, and he's mean. And we can switch it literally like that once we've tied it together. So something that you guys can start playing with in, in, in your teaching and start experimenting with. Little things, and people will think it's goofy. I don't care what people think. I care about results. I don't care what people think. People will sometimes be like, man, you're over the top. You did this. That seems goofy. And I'm like, did you get the result you wanted? At the end of the day, we always start, what's my outcome? Whatever it takes for me to get my outcome for my guys, that's what it's about. And that's what you guys are here for. You guys aren't putting in this extra time. Didn't come in here to listen to me talk, except you care about adding on results for your game and for your team's game. And that's what this is about. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about, and then I'm going to let you go, uh, is, is we've talked a lot about what to do prior to the fight, how to train, how to get trained right, how to help people train. We're talking about what to do during the fight. That's what the training is, how to get into it, how to control our mindset, how to get into that. Chad's offering a lot of stuff, and you guys already have a lot of experience there. Hands-on, street experience stuff I don't have, right? Mine's in a different realm, but there's a lot of crossover I think you can see. But one of the things that I think is really important is to talk about, uh, you know, we've got before the fight, we've got survival of the fight, and we've got survival after the fight. And, and how do we take things out of it? And what do, we, what do we go home with? And one of the things that's going to be really important, and we're not going to get into it in a, lot of, in a real deep way, and Chad's going to follow up a little bit more with it, but I just want to plant the idea that, that uh, a, achievement or a success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. So, so if, if every day you go out and do your job, but you don't know how to structure it in your mind in a way that makes you feel good and you don't start understanding that we don't make a difference and change the whole world at once, we start again from bottom up. The person we protected, that one, that one person, the one bad guy that we got off the street, the one situation, it doesn't mean that it all ends. But we have to become a master of meaning in what we do because if we don't, it doesn't matter how great of a cop you are, how great of a DT instructor you are, it doesn't matter if you're a world champion. I've coached guys, how many people knew who Evan Tanner was? world champion UFC fighter. I trained him for a number of years, right before he got his championship. Uh, that was a guy who, who couldn't master his meaning. He had everything you could want. He had a beautiful girlfriend. He got to travel all he wanted. He had a Harley, rode all over the country, had, ha didn't have to have a job because he was fighting and made more than enough money. Uh, people adored him from all over, and he basically ended up killing himself. Now, they say it's an accident, but I know more about him than a, the average person. Uh, and I think that he would want the lesson to be out there. I think he was hoping the lesson would get out. That's why I talk about it, because I knew him for quite a while. But he had demons, and he could never understand how to change the meaning. And he always could see the negative side of what was going on, and he couldn't stop and shift that, because an event in and of itself doesn't have a meaning.
it's why, again, when we talk and we talk to multiple witnesses, we get different things. Yeah, it was this person's fault. No, it was this person's fault. That person did it. No, this person. And they remember completely different things because of their frame of reference that they're working from. And from that, from these different things, from their emotional, from their past experiences, we give a meaning to things. But it doesn't mean it's true. Right? We see that all the time. We get to the bottom of it and we go, wow, that person's story was completely haywire. But in their mind, they're telling the truth. So one way of looking at what we do could be a negative. And at the end of the day, I didn't really make a difference. I'm just a world champion. I didn't really, I didn't solve world problems. I didn't do this. The other way would be, see, man, I set an example of what's possible. I showed people a way that I could come from this and build myself up to a world champion and that anything is possible. So it's all about creating that framing. And again, to, to achieve success, to, to become successful every day and go home, it's important that we go home with a, a good frame of mind because what we take home gets developed there and then we get to bring that back to work at an amplified level. And now it's gonna do one of two things. We're gonna end up with one of two spirals. We're gonna spiral this way with the wrong meanings. And it doesn't matter how good things seem from the outside, right? Kurt Cobain, we hear that and you go, how could that guy wanna kill himself? He's got everything, everybody knows who he is. He's famous, he can have anything he wants. But it's, it's because they don't know how to understand and control what their focus is on, what their language is, what their physiology is. And to attach meanings that are empowering. Because if meanings are all made up, why not make a meaning that really means something empowering to us as opposed to the other one? Because all meanings are just made up anyway. And at the end of the day, and I've seen too many people that, that you would look at from the outside and think, man, they're famous, they must be happy. And they're not, but it's, it's not because they don't have a good reason to be. It's because they don't understand how to control their emotions. If you want to truly be successful in life, in my opinion, you have to become a master of creating meanings for things. One guy says, oh, the business failed, I'm a failure. The next guy says, I learned a ton and next time it'll be better. Which one's right? The answer is what? Same. Yes. The answer is yes, they're both right. Their reality is now true. Which one's better? Is the second guy. If we're going to go ahead and guess, let's guess the right way. Because instead of going this way, what I take home, I bring back to work and go this way too. Because this, this first and foremost, what we're really talking about, first and foremost on, on three different levels. The first level is when you guys go to work, it's protect yourself. Because if you can't protect yourself, you can't protect anybody else. Right? If you go down, there's bad guys roaming around, who's going to take care of them if you're not there? So we're, 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 we approach it first from the standpoint of I have to protect self. The second thing is, we have our internal family, our brotherhood, our team. Now I have to protect team. If I can't protect myself, I can't protect team. But if I can protect myself, I can protect the weaker people when they need it, as we protect team. But the third thing is really the one that's most important. And this is the person that you bring home day in and day out after experiencing what you guys experience. Because what you do can be a challenge. You don't get to see the nice side of things every day. You get to see people that are lying to you on a constant basis, that are doing bad things. That's what you're dealing with the majority of the time, whether it's in a prison situation or on the arrest. You're not looking to pull people over and give them gold stars, unfortunately. Man, I wish that's what those lights meant. Okay? But it doesn't. And, and, and at the end of the day, if we don't control how we look at what we're doing, on a regular basis, pretty soon, what we really wanted, protect self, protect team, and most importantly, to go home, and, and we, we got this job, any job we do, we got to provide for our family and create an experience in life that's good. And again, I, I, I talk about this stuff, not because I know enough about you, but because I know enough about people. And it doesn't change, you can feel in the, it doesn't matter what you do for work. But at the end of the day, I think it's especially important for you guys, because you guys are in a position to deal with the not so nice people on a daily basis. And, and, and knowing from talking with Chad about suicide rates, depression rates, uh, marital problem rates, it, it can be out of control, but it doesn't have to be. It's key to be able to understand what's going on and put a meaning to it that's empowering to self. Because when we take care of self, we can take care of team. When we can take care of team and self, now we can go home and take care of family. Because what we bring home is the most important. Not just for ourselves, but for our wife, for our kids, for our friends, and eventually, if protecting the community, which is why you guys got involved in this job, right? It's fun, that's a piece of it, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that you can get a rush from. 
the end of the day, you guys are here because you're protectors. There's a warrior mentality. There's that warrior code that goes with that. And part of that is that you have to understand that what you do is important and makes a difference even when it doesn't seem like it does because it's the small things that add up to really make a difference. It's not, it's not the big things. Big things only happen through small things. It's like, uh, and I, I talk about this a lot, it's, a, it's about compounding effect. Everybody's, you know, your retirement plan, they talk about that. Oh, it's compounding interest. It doesn't seem like much, 30 bucks a month right now, then 50 as you can add, and pretty soon next thing you know, you're a millionaire, and you go, wow, and the graph goes here. And that's what happens in the career. You get a, a brand new guy in, and he's gone home, man. First day, guy, guy calls him an asshole, and he's like, yeah, whatever, man. I'm two years into it, man, those jerks. Five years into it, but again, it doesn't have to be that way. It's going to be compounding effect over a period of time, and that compounding effect is going to take us one way or the other. And you guys are in such a beautiful position to be able to start to spread this message on, on a base level, and how not just in, in communicating it through a verbal thing when you get these people in to train them, but to start through actions. And that's what you guys are already here to do. I mean, you guys have such a great spirit, you can already feel it. But to, to, for, to really make a difference and change, it starts with attitude, it starts with that mental aspect first. Because like Chad says, you know, what's the most important call you're on? What's the most dangerous one? It's whatever one you're on right now. Every interaction we have is a chance to build that up or to take it down. How we choose to treat people, right? And it doesn't mean that you don't get the job done or that you, you, know, you may have to get physical, you may have to bash someone, you may have to yell at them. But we're always got to keep compassion at the back of our mind. We've got to keep that idea because as soon as we lose that, we have spillover. And how you do anything is how you do everything is, is something I firmly believe in. Eventually stuff will spill over. You can't compartmentalize without it starting to affect these other areas. We can't separate out the physical, emotional, and spiritual sides of us. They are connected. You think, well, I'll just do this just at work and then I'll go home and be nice, but we see that that doesn't work. So uh, I'm going to wrap up there and just see if you guys got any questions for me, anything else that I could help with. Again, I really want to thank you guys for the opportunity to come and speak. This was a, a huge privilege and honor for me, and I hope to be able to come back and work with you guys again sometime. really hope you guys found value in today and what we went over.